a little bit of a format change. So far, um, you know, we're trying to take the feedback that we get and see how these live sessions are going. One thing we noticed is that there are a lot of people who go and watch this later on and aren't necessarily as interested in the social stuff and uh, the community aspects of the videos, uh, and it can become very confusing. So what we're what we're trying to do is separate uh, the stuff that has value as a demo in and of itself from the social stuff. So um, the, the beginning of this will basically be what it's always been. We'll go through a lot of uh, projects, we'll talk about products, reviews, things like that. Uh, after it's all done, we'll do the demo portion. So anytime I have some sort of demonstration to do, that's gonna happen at the end. And what we'll be able to do is excerpt that demo portion. I'll edit it down, make it look real nice, add some stuff to it, and put that out later, uh, and put that in the podcast feed and all that good stuff. So this way, if you're just looking, for instance, today's demo is about error repair, fixing common mistakes. You don't wanna have to sit through or, or sort of scan through a 40 minute video just to get to that, right? So you'll be able to find that easily because it's gonna be isolated from the live video. So hopefully that will be a little bit easier for people. Uh, but as far as you're concerned, if you're viewing this live right now, you're gonna get the whole thing right now. We're just going to break it up later on. Understood? All right, you wanna get over here, girlfriend? Yes. Okay. Hi. Hi. What's up? Uh, you should stand on this side. I like you on my left. It makes me feel better. Where's the... Uh... This person's name right here? <clears throat> okay, so the other thing I wanted to mention, by the way, this is my wife, Nicole. Hello. My name is Mark. Yes. We run a website called The Wood Whisperer. And uh, this video, the live videos that we do, sometimes create confusion. And we get <laughs> feedback on YouTube, which is always great. You have to be careful with YouTube feedback. Uh, but you get people saying things like, where's the content? That's my, by the way, my generic internet yeah. guy voice. Where's the content? Like I that. Know, sound uh, like Jerry Seinfeld. Yeah. What's with this video? There's no grape nuts. Uh, so yeah, the bottom line is people are complaining, or a couple people are complaining, that there's no content. I don't, they're not like, complaining. They're just like... No, that's a complaint. Right. It's a complaint. And they say, you know, that, the, that it's all advertising, right? Uh, no, a just, couple people said that yeah, about the yeah. advertising. Well, the thing is, what we're trying to do, and by the way, no one's paying for advertising mm -hmm. space in this particular session. If I talk about a product, a lot of people jump to conclusions when they see you mention a brand name. Yes. You mention a brand and suddenly it's an ad. Well, well TV has trained us very well. Yeah, it's not a product placement. I mean, it depends on your definition, but they're not paying for that placement. I don't know how to talk about products without talking about brands. So if that bothers you, uh, these, these are not the videos you're looking for. <laughs> Move along, nothing to Move see along. here. All right, so let's jump right yes. into the, the content here. So giveaway winners from last month, it was what, a Clearview Cyclone? Yeah, we gave away, we are giving away, or yeah, right we now. We gave away. We gave away. It's already given. We already announced it because <laughs> usually we like to time the announcement with the live yeah. session, um, but the first Friday of this month was a little longer and everybody was like, who won, who won? I gotta know. Well, who won, let's move um, on. It was, <laughs> Darren, Darren? Kylie? Kylie. Darren, Darren Kylie. Kylie. Congratulations. Uh, by the way, the CV1800, that's the cyclone I use in my shop. Mm -hmm. It is a big daddy five horsepower cyclone. Uh, I'm not going to say what I said last time about <laughs> brass monkeys. Um, but if you're, if you're wondering, uh, I've already contacted Darren. So if you haven't heard from me, and he's responded back. So <laughs> if, if you're like, is that me? No, that's not you. Yeah, the rule of the giveaways is if you haven't heard about it, like if you didn't get an email, you yeah. didn't win. We yeah. always email before we even say anything always. publicly. Okay, so now this month's giveaway. Mm -hmm. It seems like we keep topping ourselves every month. This is great. You, you can announce it. Very excited to announce. If you haven't seen it already, um, on, so it's already been out there, the Powermatic 15-inch Bandsaw. So good. It's awesome. This is almost $3,000 retail value. Yes. Uh, it's a 15 inch bandsaw. So if you're used to the bandsaw market in general, a lot of times you've got your, your tabletop versions, then you have your 14 inch bandsaws, which are your, your entry level floor standing bandsaws. And then you got the big daddy bandsaws. Like anything over 14 inches tends to be in that bigger category. This is 15. So it's kind of got a smaller compact size, closer to the 14 inch, a mm -hmm. little bit more capacity, but it's built like one of the monster bandsaws, like my, my 20 inch bandsaw over there. So this is a really, really nice unit, almost 3000 bucks, and we're giving one away for free. So if you want to enter to win. And people win. I mean, just regular people. Is that I unprofessional mean, to do that? Yeah, a little thewoodwhisperer.com slash giveaway. And very easy to enter, and a lot of people, like there's different ways you can enter, so you can have up to what, seven Up to entries. seven, though, you know, a lot of times when, uh, when, because it's a random, we use random.org 
with the system yeah, and it random number generator. Yeah, so it's just random. Completely. Everybody's got a chance to win, even if you don't use all the services that allow you to get extra entries. A lot of the times we see who wins, mm -hmm. and most of the time it's someone who has only one or two. Yep. So it is totally random. You got a real good chance to win. So thank you to Powermatic. Yes. Thank you to Clearview previously for supplying the Cyclone, but this month, thanks Powermatic because that's an awesome bandsaw. And I'll have another one announced next month. Sweet. I just, I keep getting awesome She says, tools. companies, give me something. <laughs> give me something to give away. Give me something. You have <laughs> lots of money. Give stuff away. All right. All right. Thank you, Nicole. Bye. Enjoy your coffee. Thank you. All right. Let's jump into uh, some news and announcements. Oh, you know what? I was, I was so busy talking to you, looking at you this whole time, mesmerized by your beauty, oh. that I forgot to put up a picture of the bandsaw. <laughs> so there's the... Uh, there's the Powermatic bandsaw that you could win, and, and the address as well, woodwhis the woodwhisper.com slash giveaway. <laughs> Mesmerized by Nicole's beauty and charm. All right, so let's get into uh, some news, announcements, and stuff. Got an email from Nick Carruthers recently who uh, sent me a great picture of a woodworker's Labor Day barbecue. If you look really closely there, you're going to see not only some delicious hot sausages, but he's sand shading in a pan of uh, sand for some inlay that he's doing. Uh, I gotta say that uh, he's got my respect. Way to go, Nick. Thanks for sharing that with us. How awesome is that, right? You got the grill on, why not? Although I don't know, I, something would end up burning for me. I'm either gonna be so worried about the food that I forget about the wood in the sand and it burns or the sausage is gonna burn because I'm worried about my inlay, one or the other. Uh, you know what else is coming up here soon? Woodworking in America. That's, uh, what is it, September 9th through the 14th, and it is in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. I just imagine that place just everywhere you go, it smells like cigarettes. Is that true? I think they make Winston-Salem. Winston <laughs> I think that's where they make cigarettes, right? The whole place just smells like tobacco. Anyway, more information at woodworkinginamerica.com. You could still register. Uh, and they also have a vendor floor, probably one of the coolest in terms of like vendors, one of the coolest collections of woodworking vendors in one place that you'll ever have a chance to go to. Um, so definitely check it out. You can also get passes just to get into the vendor floor, which uh, I highly recommend if you don't want to do all the sessions, you can at least take a look. And you know, a lot of these tools, especially the high-end hand tools, uh, we see them online, you don't really get a chance to do hands-on. Well, there's an opportunity to do it hands-on before you drop a couple hundred bucks on something. Uh, get your hands on it, try it out for yourself, see if you, you like it. Alrighty, whoopsie, stupid iPad, go away keyboard. Okay, another uh, thing coming up is the Krenov cabinet build uh, in the Wood Whisperer Guild. That's our paid membership site, uh, thewoodwhisperguild.com if you want more information on that. We started the build today with a virtual tour where we take the SketchUp drawing and just kind of um, dissect it, look at the joints that we're gonna have to do and look at the overall design. And then next week we go into rough prep and rough lumber work. So. A uh, really exciting project, and I'll show you a little sneak preview of the work that's been done so far on this display cabinet. It's really nice, if I say so myself. Uh, we also have another woodworking event. Um, boy, do I have the date on here? Yeah, September 26th through 28th in Perth, Ontario, Canada. Uh, George sent this in. Uh, Chris Wars, Tom Fidgen, Garrett Hack are among some of the speakers, and you want to go to woodwork, woodworksconference.com. There's some information for that, woodworksconference.com. So if you're in that area of Canada, uh, might be, even if you're not in that area, it might be worth the trip, because that sounds like a great event. Lots of uh, very talented and knowledgeable speakers at that one. It's awesome. Another big thing we've got coming up is the Bangle Bowl. I haven't made an official announcement about this yet, uh, but I guess that's what this is. <laughs> Bangle Bowl 2014 is sort of the brainchild of our friend Zach Higgins and uh, Kyle Toth, and they, both like making these bangles, like women's bangles. I guess, can a guy wear a bangle? Uh, yeah, why not? Generally speaking, it's just a piece of jewelry, it's right? So it's kind of a, a, you know, a nice big wooden bracelet and you can make them out of wood, you can make them with a metal core, you can make them out of like a resinous or um, resin impregnated material, but you basically are turning these things. So they've been having so much fun with them, they decided to have a competition. So there's all kind of pri uh, prizes you could win, there's a guild membership we're gonna put up for grabs, and it's really their contest, but I offered to host it at our website. Uh, so if you want more information on that, we have everything up at thewoodwhisperer.com slash bangle dash contest. What's the deadline? 
all the information's there. Basically, they're going to be accepting um, entries all throughout October, and then they're going to have a judging period after that. And they're very easy to make. Like, once you get the process down, you can make a couple in a day. Uh, and I've got a treat later. A couple of the videos I'm going to show you are their how-to videos, uh, some highlights on how you actually make these bangles. So if you want to get into turning, I think this is a great entry point. And even if you're experienced at turning, you could probably knock out some really nice, like, segmented versions would be cool. Uh, you can also use the hashtag BangleBowl2014 uh, if you want to, I guess, put a submission up or ask a question uh, with regards to the competition. All right, let's jump into our feature viewer project. Uh, every month we publish, I don't know, maybe three or four different projects over at the Wood Whisperer website. You could submit your project if you want to at uh, thewoodwhisperer.com slash submit. And we can't accept every project. We do have to kind of filter it a little bit, but we try to highlight some of the cooler, more interesting projects out there. We have one here, which I thought was very compelling. And it's a, a rocking chair, obviously, as you can see. Uh, the person's name is Jens. Now, I don't know if it's Jens with a, a, a Y sounding J or Jens, so my apologies if I'm mispronouncing it. Uh, here's what he had to say. This project was first thought up by my father, David Olson, 30 years ago when he went to a Sam Maloof workshop and saw Sam's sculpted rockers. After the chair was modeled in 3D, it was time to figure out how to actually cut and machine the chair. It probably took a month of prototyping to get the CNC accurately cutting out each of the parts. Now, did you catch what I just said there? CNC. It's not often that you're going to see a Maloof rocker, uh, something in the Maloof style, uh, that's generated from a CNC machine. And uh, I, I think what's interesting about this is it really does raise a lot of questions. And that's why it's a very, to me, a very compelling project. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk a little bit and leave these images up there so you could see them. So when you cut things on a CNC, a lot of times, especially when you're talking about a sculpted rocker, your challenge is to make that piece not look mass manufactured, right? Because uh, you know, there are limitations in what the CNC machine can do. So I think they did a great job of, of actually getting this thing, and hopefully it's at a point where they can knock them out in a certain amount of time that makes it worth all of the time they invested in the prototyping. Um, but ultimately, it needs some, some love by hand uh, to make sure that that piece doesn't look like it just popped out of a machine and looks like it actually had the hand attention and love that you generally see on these sculpted rockers. Uh, he says it takes us about a day and a half to get the lumber milled and cut on the CNC. After that, we cut the joints for the back legs using a table saw because there's no easy way to do this, uh, these precise compound cuts on the CNC. Then a couple of hours of final sanding and fitting and the chair is ready for assembly. Off the CNC, most parts are ready for a little bit of 220 sanding and then they just do the assembly. Uh, and they use the Maloof oil poly, oil wax, three coats in between. Um, says it took us two months to get the design and the first one done, but we can now produce two per week. People think about using something like a CNC to do a more traditional project like that, that typically is a sign of like the top level of craftsmanship uh, as far as woodworkers are concerned. How do you feel about a machine doing most of that work for you? Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? I want to know. Everybody's lagging very badly. Well, there's like not a... everyone. The video keeps freezing. Not a darn thing I can do about it. Okay. Oh, uh, I wish I could, but there's, we have nothing to control lag on our end. It's all on YouTube. I, like, when I look at our stats in the player, bandwidth is pegged out, meaning we have as much as we need, not, yeah. not pegged out in usage. There's plenty, and uh, CPU usage is doing what it do. All right, we'll continue. Do the best we can. Can you drop the frame right down? No. Okay. Uh, so, not, not in the middle of a session. Okay. Uh, so, all right, let's go into a couple of things that you may have missed. We call this in case you missed it. It's a very obvious name. A couple of videos here. Now, I mentioned the bracelets, the bangles, in the competition that's coming up. Kyle has a method for making a segmented bracelet, and this is a lot like segmented um, uh, vessels and things that you might make in larger format. Well, this is just a small bracelet. Great little video. You can see all the details uh, on his website or on his YouTube page. Uh, but let me show you a little uh, edited set of clips here. So here is 
my finished walnut bracelet. It has five coats of tongue oil on it. Really nice. Definitely a nice little project. I love the way he put the pieces together with the rubber bands. Really slick technique. Um, that, I don't know, I might try to make one of these bangles and I think that might be the way that I, I go if I do try to make one. Nicole says, yeah, give me some jewelry. All right, the next one here is from Zach. I don't know if you guys know this, but Zach's been writing some articles and doing interviews uh, for us on the Wood Whisperer website. So if you ever see um, right under the title, it'll have the author. Sometimes you'll see one by Zach Higgins. This is the guy. Uh, Zach is showing us how to make uh, they, they sell metal cores, right? So you can actually put the wood around this metal core. You turn the, the wood and drop, like insert the metal from both sides and then continue to turn the wood to bring it down to the level it needs to be. So really cool technique. And you can buy these kits and uh, Zach will tell you all about it. All right, welcome to the how-to video on how to make a metal core bangle. Not too bad, but it's an interesting project. Now, they work great for holiday gifts. Um, I, I sell them, so people love them. <laughs> awesome. So Zach is using um, one of the resin impregnated blanks, so it's stabilized. Uh, because if you just take a solid piece of wood and cut it into that ring shape, you may have problems down the line. So he's using the resin material, and the one Kyle was doing is segmented. Uh, so by nature, that one actually might wind up being a little bit more stable if you don't use the resin impregnated wood. At least that's my assumption on it. Um, but you could buy the blanks, you could buy the inserts, and uh, Zach has all the resources you need for that if you're interested. And in fact, the guy who makes the metal inserts, I believe, is having... Uh, all those inserts discounted during the, the period of the contest. So if people want to build along and they want to do the one with the metal band uh, on the inside, you could buy a kit for that, which is pretty cool. Um, yeah, I forgot to mention Kyle's website is uh, woodbykyletoth.com and Zach's website is nvwoodworks.com, but it's woodworks with an E, W-E-R-K-S. Uh, final video clip here is David Picciuto. You guys know him as the drunken woodworker. Uh, you've seen some of his amazing bandsaw boxes, right? Well, one of his latest boxes has this beautiful uh, CNC inlaid uh, drawer front on it. Uh, and this is a process, to, he goes through the whole process of how he makes the sandwiched um, with a, a plywood in the middle. Really, really nice and elegant. A lot of people don't think you can do a lot with plywood, but like even here, I've got some Baltic birch and I intentionally left the edge open because Baltic birch has so many fine layers to it that it actually looks pretty cool when it's finished. Uh, and I think David's box really gives you an example of why that is. Check it out. Welcome to my channel. I am David Picciuto, the Drunken Woodworker, and today I'm gonna to show you how to make this beautiful little bandsaw box. This particular one is made out of Mexican ebony and it has a plywood core. This is one of those situations where the more clamps, the better. All right, so there's the drawer. Yeah, baby, that thing is nice. You know, I've never made a bandsaw box. It's on my list one day, uh, but I've never embarked on that particular journey. Nicole, we've got to run over. We've got to take a road trip to the other side of the shop here. Uh, we're going to look at, well, it's not really a review so much as just kind of showing you a new product that's out there. This is our, our gear up segment. Uh, let's just walk everything over. I'm going to show you the new Clearview uh, Cyclone Separator. Bear with us if you're watching live. We're going to go for a walk over to the miter saw over here. Rolling, rolling, rolling. Just down here. Okay. You can move up a little bit. It's so hard to get back. There you go. In fact, I'm going to go down like this. Oh, old man knees. I'm exaggerating. Okay, we're good. So you may recall a while ago I did a shootout of uh, these cyclone separators. And uh, we'll probably link to the video if you want to go take a look at it. We reviewed three units, the Rockler uh, Dust Vortex, 
um, the CV06 from Clearview and the Dust Deputy, which you can see I've got back there. Uh, they all performed pretty well, but it was pretty clear to me at the time that the, the Dust Deputy was uh, the champ because it had the best uh, separation and had no other problems with it. Uh, but ultimately the key was how much dust makes it through this and into the vac. Now, if you're not familiar with the purpose of a cyclone, this is not, uh, there's no motor here. This is something that gets added to a shop vac or a dust extractor of some sort. So what happens is you take the hose, the input right from uh, the dust extractor, pop it into the top of this bad boy, the suction pulls through the cyclone, and then this end connects to your tool, be it a sander, or in this case, my miter saw. So when the dust comes in, it goes through the cyclone, the heavy stuff drops out, and only the lightest stuff will go through into the vac itself, which would be kept uh, caught by your filters or your bag that's in there. Now, the better these units are, the more effective they are at the separation, and you may get nothing, practically nothing at all going into the dust vac. And that was kind of the performance level I had from the Oneida. Sadly, the Mini CV06 did not perform that well. Now, there's a lot of background information I'm not going to go into in terms of why their design didn't work properly, but now they finally have the cone attached. You can see it looks very different than the old one, but it looks a lot like the uh, CV1800, the big unit, right? This thing works flawlessly. Uh, really happy to see the performance on this one. I like Clearview. I'm rooting for them. They're a sponsor of the show, so I like to see them put out good product um, because it's hard for me. It just makes me sad when I have to say bad things about a company I like. But ultimately, this thing works just awesome. So I've got this now connected to my dust extractor and over the course of the last couple of days I've been I've done quite a bit of work just with uh, the Krenov cabinet, made a lot of cuts and there's no dust in this at all. All of the dust is living inside here. In fact, if you want, I don't want to keep it open too long because I really don't feel like breathing this stuff. Uh, as soon as I upset it, it will start to kick up. Uh, but if you can, Nicole, zoom in down on this bucket so you can see what's actually in here from the miter saw. Yeah, very fine dust, right? And that's the stuff that a lot of times would pass through and go right into the filter and clog up your, your vacuum system. In this case, we're trapping it. We're trapping it well before it even gets there. So that's that much less of that dangerous fine dust hitting the vacuum filters or hitting the, um, the bag that's in there. Less chance of that stuff being exhausted into the shop environment. And here's the other thing. If you're cheap like me, one of the worst purchases. The purchases that I hate the most are for these disposable things or the, uh, the, the consumables, uh, things we go through a lot. And, and uh, dust vac filter bags, I hate buying them. They're so expensive and if you do a lot of work you go through them very quickly. So you can conceivably have a filter on here for years before you actually, I, I keep saying filter, a bag, which actually acts like a filter too, but um, you can have the bag, the same bag on here for years before you need to replace it because 99.9% .9 of the stuff is going into this bucket and you just lift the bucket up, dump it out, bring it back, you're back in action, right? So you could save, I mean, it costs, um, uh, the Oneida unit is about 100 bucks, this one is about 150. Um, that's a, really, if you think about long term, that's a small investment considering how much the filter bags cost, right? So cyclone separators, really good idea in your shop if you don't already have one, okay? Head back to the bench. I'll follow you. Oh, we're going this way? Okay. Walk with me. This is our sophisticated setup here. I might have to build like a little shelf for the tripod. It's kind of a neat idea. Just to hang the laptop off of it. Let's bring it on back to the workbench. Oh, let me walk around you. Keep going. Walking in circles. All right. Sorry about that. I know that's probably a little disorienting. It's disorientating. So uh, I, will, I will be doing an update video on that cyclone. So you can see a little bit more closer action. I will, uh, in fact, give it the same Ooh, girlfriend. Isn't it? Yeah, it is. Why is it off? Oh, that's why. Yeah. I'm going to give that cyclone the same test parameters I did previously, and uh, you'll see how it performs and how it stacks up against the competition again. Okay.
that was gear up, right? So let's look at uh, let's look at the Krenov cabinet progress. This is this is fun stuff. I'm gonna bring it over to the bench. Here is the core cabinet. All right, so this is this is a Krenov influenced design. It's not a Krenov design itself. Uh, definitely takes on some influence. We've got some really Beautiful dovetails for the case. Through dovetails at the top, at the bottom. All right, this shelf is just dadoed in. And then we have a nice drawer with a center mounted runner. Like this. Pretty nice, huh? That puppy just slides in like so. Nice and smooth. Curved shelves, curved drawer front, and half blind dovetails on the side of the drawer, right? And we pull it all the way out, and you'll see we've got through dovetails in the rear. Now the whole cabinet itself is going to be held up by some really tall legs. It's a standing cabinet, and that's really kind of one of Krenov's um, things that he's most famous for are his standing cabinets on these big, beautiful legs. Uh, so you see we have mortises here ready to go, and those will hold our legs in place. Now I have a couple of rough legs to show you. These guys are going to be mounted like this. Of course, that's in the way. You know, roughly like that. And there'll be a, a shelf down the bottom as well. So we'll have a lot of fun cutting these out, uh, compound curves, and then of course we have to sculpt them because they're real um, angular and, and square at this point. And ultimately, we want them to have a little bit more of a rounded look to them. So we have a substantial amount of hand work to get these down to the, the size and the shape that we're looking for. All right, so a lot of good techniques on this one. I'm excited about it. And if you want to build along with it, you can certainly do that at thewoodwhisperguild.com. And there it is. Oh, this is, in case anyone wants to know, this is uh, quarter sawn sycamore, the material that we used has some really amazing grain on it that I'm quite fond of. The sides have some nice patterns too. It's good stuff. Quarter on sycamore, the legs are walnut. It's one of those projects too where um, there's not a lot to it, you know, substance wise. It's just four legs and a standing cabinet. So it's one of those times where using uh, woods that really make a bold statement in terms of grain. It's a good idea because, you know, everything else is understated. So let the wood speak. And the wood becomes part of, like, the most impressive aspect of the project if you choose the wood wisely. All right, let's move into a little bit of Q&A. What do you say, Q&A? I may need a little bit of camera work on this, hon. I'm hoping that lag has calmed down. <clears throat> all right, so this is where I get a little disorganized because I've got stuff all over the place. So if you have a question, feel free to leave a question in the little chat room that's on YouTube, or you can use the chat room on our live page, thewoodwhisperer.com slash live. Uh, we're only going to be able to take a couple of questions. I've got some pre-selected here. So it pays when I ask, like, solicit questions online ahead of time. That's the best time to get a question in because I choose the lion's share from that. Uh, and then we grab a couple live as well. All right, so I've got a couple here pre-selected. Tom Cocker asks, uh, how do you keep your enthusiasm up for a project when it begins to run out of steam? I'm so close to the end of a couple of big projects, but struggling to make myself finish. Any suggestions? Well, I guess it really depends on the reason for your lack of motivation, and I don't know what that reason is. You know, some people just lose steam at the end because they're just completely unmotivated by the project itself. The project is not exciting to them anymore. Or maybe they've reached a point in the project that is not their favorite part of the process. How many people get to the end and realize the only thing left to do is put on a coat of polyurethane or shellac or whatever, and that's where they stall. Why? Because they don't really like the process. They don't enjoy it. So if that's the reason, that's a little bit more difficult. I can't make you love finishing um, other than to say practice it more. And the more you do it, the better you get at it, the more you're going to appreciate the results of your work. So you know, uh, you know that the end result requires you to get through this step, to push through it, and it's totally worth it 
because the end result is going to look fantastic and someone's going to come up to it and go, oh my gosh, this is a beautiful piece of furniture you've built. Um, so that's one thing. Now, for me personally, when I, when I run out of steam, most of the time, it may be a motivational thing, but ultimately it comes down to organization for me. Uh, I run out of steam when I feel inundated by having too many things going on at once or a project with too many phases and stages that I can't see my way to the finish line. And that's the problem, is you're so focused on the finish line that you lose sight of what's right in front of you. And I've said this a lot of times in the past, it comes down to making an outline and making a list. And I will print out off a of Google Calendar, because analog for some reason works really well for me with this stuff. I print out my month's calendar and I break my tasks down on a per day basis. So if you're at the end of the project, there's probably maybe two or three things that you still need to do. Put those on a schedule. And it's amazing the mental shift that takes place when you say, I'm doing this tomorrow, I'm doing this the next day. You sort of feel, at least me, I feel more motivated to get that thing done. And, I, and really the reason is because I'm not worried about what I'm doing on Friday. I'm worried about what I'm going to do on Tuesday because it's Tuesday. And then my sense of accomplishment at the end of the, day, of the day is greater because I met my goal for that day. I'm not still far away from Friday. I'm not thinking about Friday. Just think about the day that you're on. And suddenly the whole paradigm shifts and you, at least for, again, for me personally, it just motivates me more. So that would be my suggestion. Hopefully that will help you as well, Tom. Or the Pomodoro technique. The who to how to The Pomodoro technique. That sounds like a delicious Italian meal. It's, well, if you, if you Google uh, tomato timer, there's a technique called the Pomodoro technique. The Pompadour technique? Pomodoro. Isn't that a hairdo? No, no, no. Not, isn't a Pompadour a hairdo? Yeah, yeah, but that's not what I'm talking about. Oh. It's, it's when you, if you're having trouble, and this, is, this applies to anything that you're having trouble getting started on, where you devote a specific amount of time, so mm. 20 minutes working on that task, solely on that task, right. and then you take five off. And you do this, in a, it, it's, it's actually a, a very well-known method to kind of get over the hump. Nice. So, the pompadour technique. No! Give the, it a shot. <laughs> just Google tomato timer or pomodoro. Or pompadour. <laughs> or veal scallopini. Parmesan. Okay, next question I've got here from Brian. Brian says he's thinking of going the hand plane route to mill wood instead of power tools. Don't do it! What kind of setup should I go with? Meaning, recommending a couple of planes as a hand tool newbie. It's a really good question. And uh, I do have a recommendation for you. You guys know that I don't really mill stock from rough to, uh, to finished with hand tools. But I can give you some perspective on it. Okay. Now... One of my favorite videos that I've ever seen that kind of put hand tools in a, in a particular and very useful perspective for me was a Chris Schwartz title uh, called Coarse Medium Fine. And in that, Chris outlines how, a lot like power tools, you've got your coarse milling tools, you've got your medium milling tools, and then your fine milling tools. Uh, the same thing applies in hand tool woodworking. So you have to have ways to handle the wood at those different stages. So you don't need every number along the, the Stanley number scale, right? Truth is, you only need one plane for coarse work, one plane for medium work, and one plane for fine work. So a lot of times what that recommendation typically comes down to is the coarse work can be done. Now keep in mind, there's coarse and then there's like really coarse. So you may need uh, a scrub plane or something. That's a plane usually with a narrow body and a very curved blade that will allow you to hog out a serious amount of material. That's when you've got a board that's just not the right thickness and you need to really remove a lot of stock. It leaves a very scalloped surface though, uh, so it's a very, very rough tool. A lot of people can get away with not having that just by buying their material pretty close to the dimension they want it to be anyway. So from that point, now we're talking about, again, coarse, medium, fine. Now this is a number five jack plane. You can tune up a jack plane for fairly rough cuts, and you can use this to do the initial rough work. Get all those high spots down, uh, start to you know, look for all the valleys and work anything that's too high. There's twist, you work the corners that are a little bit too high. Um, you've got a medium length plane here, uh, but you know something like this, you're not really so much worried about flattening completely at this point, you're just kind of rough flattening. After that stage, it really comes down to getting a nice flat surface and straight surfaces. And that's where a nice long plane body like this comes in handy. This is a number seven, a number eight is a little bit bigger, uh, but this will work to give you nice 
long straightaway cuts. And that's why the, the sole is so long because you have to be able to um, ignore the low and the high valleys and just kind of skate over the top and skim anything that's too high off of the surface, right? That's the number seven. That's what you would consider your medium. And then you've got a smooth plane and this is your fine work, right? This is uh, finished preparation essentially. So once the surface is nice and flat and even, you can use a smooth plane to do the final smoothing to make it ready for finish, right? And you've got your coarse, medium, fine. Those three will probably be the initial set that will get you the furthest. Um, there's a lot of variations of these three. You could, you know, maybe you don't have a number five, maybe you do want a scrub plane there. Um, excuse me. Uh, maybe instead of a, a, you know, number four smoother, uh, you know, you could substitute in all, you know, some of the other size smoothers. Here's another perspective on it. If you're really just getting your feet wet, jack planes are great, especially a low angle jack plane. And I talk about this bad boy all the time. Um, while it isn't necessarily as good as having all three of these, you can actually do most of these jobs with this one plane if you wanted to. Uh, you can get a couple different irons for it with different angles. You could have some that are cambered, meaning having a little bit of curve on them. So have a cambered version and then stick that blade out a little bit further and now you're doing more rough work with it. So you can get a lot done with a jack plane and especially this low angle jack version uh, is, is one of my favorites. And frankly, because I have this, my need for these three has gone down significantly. Um, but I don't do what you're talking about, milling from raw stock. Um, so this is a reflection of the type of work that I do and the type of tools that I have in my shop. All right? So again, coarse, medium, fine. Chris Schwarz is definitely a good place to go. And let me just get this big boy in here. Move on to the next question. Next is from Russell. Our good buddy, Russell, who's here in the Phoenix area. Russell says, I was wondering, nope, wrong one. He says, how much do you tell clients about wood movement? Do you educate them, give them a quick warning, or leave them to experience the wonder themselves? I think it's a great question. You know, even if you don't sell your work now, ultimately, at some point, you will be giving uh, something you made to someone or selling it for a low price. Uh, and the person is going to, at some point or another, most likely experience the wonders of wood movement. So how much do you prepare people for it? Well, when it comes to selling, you know, client relationship, it's a matter of disclosure and expectations. So it's, I think, it's incredibly important for you to let them know uh, ahead of time, almost as a sort of expression of what kind of warranty you're gonna be able to give the product to say that this is a natural product, it's going to move, I tried in my design of this product to minimize the effects of wood movement, uh, and hopefully that's exactly what you're doing. If it's a real small piece, it may not even be a factor, uh, but ultimately if you build a big piece with breadboard, end, you know, a nice table with breadboard ends, you have to make sure they know what to expect because you don't want to get that frantic call that says, oh my gosh, you know, this, this thing was even before and now it's not even anymore. Um, that's not the time to break it to them that wood moves. So I think it's absolutely important ahead of time to educate the customer at the level that they can understand it. Sometimes too much information can be overwhelming and they just kind of sh shut you off. And maybe they realize that, oh, maybe I don't want to work with this person because they're warning me about all this wood movement, uh, but you have to give them some information. Uh, and generally for me, anytime I've worked with someone that just comes in the form of explaining here where we have potential wood movement issues, someday you may see this edge isn't as smooth as it once was. You may feel this glue line later on down the road, but um, but embrace it because it's wood, it's a natural product. That's why you're coming to me for this product because you want someone who can handcraft it. And if you want that, here are the, here's the baggage that comes along with it. I mean, put a more positive spin on it than that, but um, you do, I feel, have to let them know 100% upfront so that you aren't called back and uh, made to be a, a bad woodworker <laughs> when they get mad at you. Uh, let's see, next question here is from Mike Pickering. He says, I'm wondering if you, oh, you're going to love this one, Nicole. I'm wondering if you, AKA your wife, have a tool budget. I'll let you know right now, Nicole does not have a tool budget. <laughs> Primarily, if you get a certain percentage of gross profits to put back into the shop or a certain percentage of net or a set dollar amount. Uh, or if you just wear down the wife till she gives in and lets you get a new toy. I think what he's asking is, uh, what is my allowance? Hmm. Do I have an allowance? Well, here's the thing. I know everyone's relationship dynamic with their significant other is different. 
And, uh, you know, so my situation certainly is not uh, going to apply to everybody. Um, but here, here's the history. When I first started woodworking and I was working in biotech, uh, we were living off of credit cards. You know, we were both making stupid choices when it came to our debt. And at that time, we, we really kind of, you know, we might... Yeah, Nicole was, was actually the problem at that point, right? Because <laughs> I would say, I just saw Norm use this biscuit joiner thing. That looks really cool. And a couple days later, I would find a biscuit joiner in my shop, my garage at the time. And uh, so Nicole's a little bit of a rare breed in that sense, where she was part of the problem. Uh, now that was then, of course, and, and we've uh, gotten, <laughs> have since gotten rid of uh, all of our credit cards, except for the most essential emergency ones. So now it is more of a budget conscious decision, but here's the thing, this is a business. So as a business, uh, Nicole knows that I've got a good head on my shoulders and I don't just buy stuff because I've got nothing better to do. Um, I've earned trust and there's a two-way trust between us about uh, how it concerns money and I hope everyone has that in their relationship. Um, so there is no wearing down needed, there is no, when it comes to tools, honestly, there's no conversation needed. If I need a tool or want a tool because I think it's good for the business or it would make me happy, I go out and buy it. Um, so it's again, it's the reflection of the fact that this is a business and not just a, a hobby for me. Do you have any perspective on this? A little bit. Um, I will say early on, um, when we bought our first home, I, I really wanted you to do a lot of projects. So Here's I, a table saw, put you, in a floor. That's kind of what I, you know, I looked at, it was almost like a little, well, I bought you this tool, you gotta use it now. It's, yeah, obligating me to get these jobs done, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it worked. It did, and then, and then you flipped it on me, you were like, well, if you want, and then you started going, well, if you want me yeah, to do this. That's right, I learned, I, that's, I forgot biscuit. about that. I need this biscuit Well, joiner. if I'm gonna do this, I need this tool. Yeah, and it, well, and the thing is, at the time, honestly, you were the breadwinner. Mm -hmm. So you had a little bit more, you know, we always kept separate bank accounts early on, but she had a little bit more... Um, Flexibility. Uh, you had a little more power in, in terms of the finances mm -hmm. than I did. Um, you know, when you make twice as much as... <laughs> and I like doing nice things for you, so... Yeah. so and, but the know. thing is, now it's a totally different situation. Um, and, and to be frank, uh, you guys have seen my shop. There isn't a whole lot I mean, at this point. Um, you know, over 10 years into the woodworking scene, I've got just about everything I actually need. So most of the time when product comes in, it's in, you know, an upgrade for something else or maybe it's a review that I'm doing and I may not even use the product. So I, I actually don't really buy stuff very often anyway. I will say that if you play the card, honey, I will build you this. If I can get this tool, you better follow through. I'm just warning you. It may not always work. If you don't follow through, you've pretty much demolished that, that won't work anymore. line of, um, <laughs> uh, I guess, ar the argument for any future purchases. That tactic is dead. Yeah. So if you're gonna if you're gonna buy a tool and you convince her to get a, you know, a tool and you say I'm gonna build you a bookcase. Build that the bookcase. The faster you can do it, the better, because <laughs> then it's just a matter of. Then you can, well, you, we did, um, you did a, a, an article, build versus buy. Oh, yeah, yeah, the build or buy worksheet. So, right. Mark, and then we have it on the website, too. So, it's a little kind of checklist of should you build or buy a particular piece of furniture. So, mm -hmm. that's print that you could show. Yeah, oh, <laughs> this, like, says, this says, this says I should, I need I to should build, it. build this, so I need this tool to do it. <laughs> yeah, and you know what else works really well? Get the new tool bring it into the shop, cover it with dust, and hopefully they won't notice that it's there. I like that method. <laughs> All right, let's uh, go to one more question. Oh, I forgot to move that down. Look at that. It's right, it's almost like I'm topless. Hey boys. All right, uh, Terry has a question here. I wanna carve a name oops, into a project and I'd like to stain the name dark, but not have the rest of the project stained. So how do I do that? It's a great question. And I have a prop. I've got a prop to use. Nicole, I probably need you on the camera. Let me get a, a sander ready here and I'll show you a quick technique. Okay. Uh, get a shot closed down here. Right. 
Now, I don't mean to brag, but I am kind of an expert carver. <laughs> Get a little more of a close up of that. You might want to make sure that they know you're joking. If they don't know I'm joking, they somehow ended up in the wrong place today. <laughs> I don't mean to brag, but that is, that's a letter M, and I did that by hand. There's no template for that. You see what this is? Did you end? Are we going into demo now? No. Okay. No, we're, we're still in the appetizer. Oh, okay. The real meat's on its way. Catering this event. All right, so um, if you can, come in closer. I need more of a top down on this so they can actually see. There you go. All right, so what I did here, I've got a piece of maple and I've carved some very elegant looking, uh, high quality letters. Watch out, Mary May, I'm coming for you. <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be guesting on the Mary May School of Carving soon. Uh, basically, I just did this so you could see the effect here. So, um, and I, obviously all I know how to do are M's and O's. And this actually is a V with a circle on the top. So <laughs> here's the technique. If you, if you shellac the surface or lacquer, I wouldn't use an oil-based finish because oil-based finishes take too long to dry for this process. I want something that dries on top of the wood, doesn't absorb too deep, dries quickly because I want to add a couple of coats and move on with the work. This side is uncoated, this side has the shellac. So the idea is by pre-coating the material, you could then do your carving, come back and stain, and then you can see what I did was I put the stain into the letter, not very careful about it, uh, wiped off the excess, wiped off the excess. I did the same thing over here, but you could see, obviously we get a lot more stain penetration. Now, once your carving is done, you can go back and sand off the shellac and the stain stays you know, in, the, in the deep pockets there. All right, so I'm gonna actually sand this real quick. Uh, shouldn't be too noisy. And let's look at the result. I'm gonna focus more on the shellac side of things. Hope it doesn't mess up my beautiful lettering. <laughs> I'm going to carve you a sign later. Thanks. What can we connect here? Yeah, I don't know. I just wanted to sand a little bit so that you can get the idea. I sanded over both of these surfaces approximately the same amount of time. Look how clean this is and look how dirty that still is. So we would have to remove a substantial amount of wood to be able to get all of that stain out, which makes it very hard. I mean, you can't, you could certainly use a paintbrush or something to get in there, but that's just too much work. I'd rather slather it with stain, wipe the excess off, and then be able to sand. So here, of course, if you don't like the shellac on there, sand a little bit more and you'll get that finish off. Um, but if anything, most of the time I like to pre-seal with shellac anyway, right? So give it a light sanding. When the stain is gone, stop. And then you could start with your final top coat, whatever you want. But look how nice and clean that is now. And check, this is, I should probably teach people how you make this one side fatter than the other. <laughs> I, and also the technique of not quite being at the right angle. It's nice, right? <laughs> All right. Um, yeah. Mary May does have an excellent carving school. I think I need to. Uh, <laughs> I think I need to talk to her about getting myself a little membership. Cause I'm terrible. <laughs> I actually can do a little bit of carving. I've just never really practiced. practiced very much, and that was not a real attempt. That was done in about thirty seconds, and that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Okay, so here's the deal. Uh, oh, do we have any other live questions? That was my pre-selected questions. We can do a couple of live questions, but I still have a demo to do on repairing mistakes. So stick around for that, and I don't want to be here all day. Um, it's already been an hour, almost. Yeah. So let's do. Uh, let's pick two questions. So I, I don't know how to get you these questions. I Gmail. Can, yeah. Well. If you want, just read it. Okay. So Jarrett wants to know uh, why are power joiners called jointers slash planers? It's just, it just seems like they are different items. Is it possible to use a joiner as a planer and it, and it works? So. Uh, well, power jointers, at least in the US, to my knowledge, are not called jointer planers. The jointer is the jointer. That's the long bed unit where you're running the wood over it. 
and the planer is the planer. Now, I know overseas, they have some different terminology. So it just is like anything else. Sometimes we, we give things dumb names for historical reasons that don't quite make as much sense to us nowadays, but we still use them. So I don't know enough about the, the history as to why uh, internationally it might be called one thing. And well, I know why, because in the US we like to do things, you know, our own way, because it's America. Um, but honestly, that's a really good question. I would love someone who has a more historical perspective on it to give us an answer to why they call it that. But at least in the States, joiners are typically just sold as jointers. If you see something sold as a jointer planer, most of the time that's a combo machine that actually can be uh, converted to do planing as well as jointing. So I, I totally agree, it can get pretty confusing. Uh, S. Smith wants to know if I have a preference for dowling jigs. There's, there's quite a few low-budget doweling jigs on the market. You could even make your own uh, if you wanted to. If you're using wood, the wood can get worn out. So I, I've made doweling jigs that are kind of disposable for a particular project. Uh, but if you're looking for one that's a more permanent solution, uh, Dowel Max is probably one of the best ones on the market. There's a couple other decent ones too. I don't remember the names of those, but Dowel Max sticks in my head. It's the one I've had some experience with. Uh, and man, is that a really well-designed, nice jig. It's expensive too. That's the thing, that's, that's the hardest thing about it. So there are a, a bunch of lower budget ones. I can't even tell you uh, the differences between them. I've used a couple, there's like a round one where you could turn different things and ultimately you just gotta be able to um, secure it to the workpiece nice and consistently. So you could you know, put a hole in one piece and put a hole in the adjoining piece in the same location. Uh, and even the most basic ones can accomplish that goal. Um, you just might not have as much of a fancy setup or as easy setup as you might have with something like the Dalmax. Impact Vector. In our chat room. From the chat room. What's the ideal tool for dust collection on a compound miter saw? It's going to depend on the saw. Uh, if you have the Capex, a standard dust extractor works really well. Even a shop vac will work well. Dust collection on, on a miter saw more seems to come down to the saw itself as opposed to which collector is attached to it. A lot of them have like zero dust collection capabilities. So you'll see people build those big shrouds and then hook up a full scale four inch hose to it with a uh, big dust collector or a cyclone to try to capture as much as that, uh, a much, uh, excuse me, as much of the airborne dust as possible. I don't really like that method. If you can get a saw, and I know there are brands that actually have, it may not be as effective as the design on the Capex, but it still works pretty well. The thing is you really want to collect that dust at the source. If you let that dust go airborne, it just becomes exponentially more difficult to capture it with a cone than if you were able to kind of capture it right at the source. And I think that's what uh, I think Festool uh, did really, really well was having good dust collection that transfers a lot of the suction right behind the blade. And then the key to it working really well is this rubber fixture that they have right behind the blade, uh, flexible rubber so it works over a workpiece, but it essentially cups and directs the suction and directs the wood chips right into that area. So it's, it's incredibly effective. And I hope all miter saw, saw companies like see that and start to adopt that and incorporate better dust collection because by the time you're collecting it in that shroud, um, it's an uphill battle. Collect it at the source and you don't need nearly as powerful of a machine to do it. Standard shop vac will do the trick. Uh, Donald Dean, can you put lacquer over an oil or oil varnish mix? Yes, you can. If the oil or oil varnish mix is completely cured, you will have your best results because the lacquer just, you know, will have no problem for the most part binding to it. Uh, but keep, be careful because some of those oil-based mixtures have a very long cure time. Now I've even, you know, things like shellac and lacquer, because of the type of finish that they are and the way that they cure, I've even in a rush put them over surfaces that aren't completely cured. People will take shellac and put it over, let's say they do an oil varnish blend and it's just sticky after a couple of days because maybe they put too much on or too many coats and they want to switch to some other type of finish. Uh, they'll put something like shellac, a couple layers of shellac to seal that in. Now it's not the greatest thing to do, but it can work, right? So usually when you're switching over that, to that type of finish um, to solve a problem, you can seal that uncured finish in. Not a great idea, but it can be done. So if you let the stuff cure, um, you should really have no major issues switching over to, uh, to lacquer, but always test on scraps just to make sure, uh, but it can be done. 
All right, last question before the demo, okay? Okay. <laughs> Obi-Wan Kenobi, I love it. <laughs> uh, do you use Craig Jigs or do you make your own? Is that my only two choices? <laughs> is, there, is there a neither option? I have a Craig Jig. Uh, keep it right over there in my little thingy, turnstile thingy. Uh, I don't use pocket screws all that much in my work. There are times where a pocket screw really is the best choice for a particular application and I, uh, that doesn't come up very often in my work. So I have a Craig Jig. I think Craig makes uh, one of the best ones, if not the best one out there, clearly the, the, the name that's known for it. Uh, you can't think of pocket screws without thinking about Craig. Uh, so they make some good products. So if you're in the market, that'd be the first place I would look. Um, I wouldn't, I mean, I guess you could build your own, but uh, some of the entry level Craig kits are pretty affordable and um, they work really well. So. Well, when customers wanted to get the price down, remember? Yeah, that was, that was a time when I was building furniture for a living as a woodworking business. I would use my pocket hole jig a lot more often because you're, in that case, you're solving a lot of problems. You're trying to get to a price point where using traditional joinery may not be something that can get you there. At the same time, you have to make sure the client is aware of what you're doing. Um, and sometimes a client may see screws and not be so happy with it, depending on uh, their knowledge base about what you're doing. And a lot of times people who come to custom woodworkers, they know just enough to be dangerous. Uh, and they come at you with certain expectations, sometimes unrealistic expectations, especially when it comes to price and what they're getting for that money. Uh, so sometimes a pocket screw can be a really good uh, alternative choice. Last one. Last one, McGinn's Wood Shop. I like that. Sounds like a good place to go to get a nice beer, nice. a nice pint of ale. Uh, and don't woodwork afterwards though. <laughs> What's a good method to check bandsaw wheel alignment? I have one I restored and no matter where I set the top wheel angle, the bottom won't stay center. Uh, you know, well, here's the thing. Generally speaking, you can uh, take the, the cabinets, like open the cabinet doors. If you can even remove the table, that'll be very helpful. Uh, sometimes you could just unbolt the table uh, because what you want to do is get a straight edge in there and see if those wheels are coplanar. Sometimes you need to shim them out so you can actually get a washer of some sort, like a fender washer or something. Uh, put that in the one that's offending and just try to make sure they're in alignment with one another. Uh, and that way, if they're starting off in alignment with one another, when you start to tilt the angle a little bit, you know, you'll be in pretty good shape. Now that said, if it isn't perfectly centered, what I would be focused on more, I mean, unless it's, unless the blade is tracking and moving or it's really, really close to the edge of that bottom wheel, um, th those are the two situations I'd be really worried about it. But if it's tracking straight, and it isn't moving, and it's centered on the top wheel, but it's just a little off center on the bottom, cut something. See how it cuts. Is it moving when you cut it? Is there something you need to be concerned about? Is it cutting straight? If it still cuts and it's just slightly off center on the bottom, I don't know that I would worry about it that much. Right? So, so see if the work itself causes any additional issues. If you see a result that you don't like, or it feels unstable or unsafe, um, then dig a lot deeper if uh, the initial adjustments don't get you where you need to be. But I don't know that I would be excessively worried about that on the bottom wheel. Um, yeah, test it out and see. But again, shims may be the way, uh, using washers as shims to push the wheels out to get them in uh, sort of the same plane. We're good? Yep. All right. I'm gonna wrap it up. Yeah, let's wrap it up. Slide on over here, girl. Okay. So that should wrap it up for the live show. Okay. Uh, you know, the next show is gonna be October 3rd, 1 p.m. October, it's fall. I know, I'm so looking forward to the fall. The air, conditions, air conditioners have been running constantly. I'm just so sick of air conditioned yeah. air at this point. I wanna open a window. Oh, I can't wait. Right? Okay, uh, yeah, next show, October 3rd, join us. It's gonna mm -hmm. be a good one, uh, Friday, as usual. First same Friday time. every month. Yeah, first Friday of every month is what we're aiming for. Uh, contact info, thewoodwhisperer.com is where you can find lots of great free uh, plans and videos and articles and all kinds of fun stuff. Uh, also archives of the live sessions like this, you'll find them there. Facebook.com slash thewoodwhisperer. Oh, I have a little contact dealie that I could put up. Look at this. Boom, baby. Boom, baby. Uh, also on Twitter, at woodwhisperer. And then if you have a question, anytime, um, not a lot of people using it, but it's there, TWW Live with a hashtag. Uh, is where you can just send us a quick question. And a lot of times if you do that, because not many people are using it, I notice it mm -hmm. and it gets put into the queue and then I can answer it next time. And I know that there were a number of people in the chat room. Thanks for hanging out with me, by the way. I'm in the chat room as we're recording this live. Um, there were a number of people that had questions about the Guild. 
oh. and specifics about that. So if you head on over to the woodwhisperer.com, or no, it's just woodwhisperer. The woodwhisperer guild .com. Guild .com. Um, If you go into the additional details, there's actually a little um, uh, chat option that you can email me directly through that. So if you have questions, I'm more than happy to answer anyone's questions about the projects, mm -hmm. how it works, and all that fun and stuff. And you know what? After the demo, yeah. if anyone has any questions about the Guild or anything else, I'll, I'll stay for a few more minutes. Uh, here's the thing. We're going to close this off right now. So thank you for watching, everybody. And if you're watching live, stick around because we're moving into the next segment, which is a demo. Demo. The demo is on fixing mistakes. So I'm going to dive into that a little bit. It won't take very long. It's a short demo, uh, but it's kind of an add-on thing. Uh, if you're looking for this demo after the fact, we're going to actually cut off this live video. We'll link to it. Uh, and then we'll link to a re-sort of edited, reproduced version so you can really get more detail about uh, fixing mistakes. Right? Okay. So stick around. Nicole, I'm going to need you at the camera for this for the most part.